Hi, this is your host Danny and this is English Plus Podcast. Well, today's episode is very special because the hero of today's episode is one of my favorite, well actually not one of my favorite, it is my favorite character from all Greek mythology and this one is Orpheus. Now for those who haven't heard of Orpheus before, you will know everything you need to know about Orpheus. We will talk about Orpheus, the love between Orpheus and Eurydice and his journey to the underworld trying to save his beloved one from the land of the dead. If you're interested, if you want to learn more about Orpheus and you want to hear about this great story, join me in this Myths and Legends episode from English Plus Podcast. Welcome to a new episode from English Plus Podcast where you get to learn English, business, culture, literature and a lot more. Two things to remember that you will always find extra practice on our website, englishpluspodcast.com. And don't forget to support us on Patreon to help us keep our content free forever. And now this is your host, Danny, and let's enjoy a new episode from English Plus Podcast. In Greek mythology, Orpheus is a musician who sang and played so beautifully that even animals, rocks, and trees danced to his tunes. He was the son of Calliope, the muse of epic poetry, and the god Apollo. It was Apollo who gave Orpheus his first lyre, the musical instrument that he always played. Orpheus accompanied Jason and the Argonauts on their quest for the Golden Fleece and used his music several times to ease their journey. On one occasion, he calmed the sea with his playing. Another time, he saved the Argonauts from the deadly sirens by playing so loudly that they could not hear the sirens' songs. Also, he stopped the Argonauts from quarreling with a song about the origins of the universe. But I'm not going to focus on these stories, I'm going to focus on the story of Orpheus and Eurydice because it is so beautiful, so sad, so touching, and to be honest, I'm just in love with this story. So Orpheus fell in love with the nymph Eurydice, and shortly after their marriage, Eurydice was bitten by a snake and died. And this is where the story starts. The story will start from here and it will continue all the way to the underworld and we will see what happens later. So, let's hear about Orpheus and Eurydice. In the legend of Orpheus the Greek, love of music found its fullest expression. Orpheus, it is said, could make such heavenly song that when he sat down to sing, the trees would crowd around to shade him. The ivy and vine stretched out their tendrils. Great oak would bend their spreading branches over his head. The very rocks would edge down the mountainsides. Wild beasts crouched harmless by him and nymphs and woodland gods would listen to him enchanted. Orpheus himself, however, had eyes for no one but the nymph Eurydice. His love for her was his inspiration, and his power sprang from the passionate longing that he knew in his own heart. All nature rejoiced with him on his bridal day, but on that morning, as Eurydice went down to the riverside with her maidens to gather flowers for a bridal garland, she was bitten in the foot by a snake and she died in spite of all attempts to save her. Orpheus was inconsolable. All day long he mourned his bride, while birds, beasts and the earth itself sorrowed with him. When at last the shadows of the sun grew long, Orpheus took his lyre and made his way to the yawning cave which leads down into the underworld where the soul of dead Eurydice had gone. 
Even Grey Cairon, the ferryman of the Styx, forgot to ask his passenger for the price of crossing. The dog Cerberus, the three-headed monster who guards Hades' gate, stopped full in his tracks and listened motionless until Orpheus had passed. As he entered the land of Hades, the pale ghosts came after him like great, uncounted flocks of silent birds. All the land lay hushed as that marvelous voice resounded across the mud and marshes of its dreadful rivers. In the daffodil fields of Elysium, the happy dead sat silent among their flowers. In the farthest corners of the place of punishment, the hissing flames stood still. A cursed Sisyphus, who toils eternally to push a mighty rock uphill, sat down and knew not he was resting. Tantalus, who strains forever after visions of cool water, forgot his thirst and ceased to clutch at the empty air. The pillared hall of Hades opened before the hero's song. The ranks of long-dead heroes who sit at Hades' board looked up and turned their eyes away from the pitiless form of Hades and his pale, unhappy queen. Grim and unmoving sat the dark king of the dead on his ebony throne, yet the tears shone on his rigid cheeks in the light of his ghastly torches. Even his hard heart, which knew all misery and cared nothing for it, was touched by the love and longing of the music. At last the minstrel came to an end, and a long sigh like wind in pine trees was heard from the assembled ghosts. Then the king spoke, and his deep voice echoed through his silent land. Go back to the light of day, he said. Go quickly while my monsters are stilled by your song. Climb up the steep road to daylight and never once turn back. The spirit of Eurydice shall follow. But if you look around at her, she will return to me. Orpheus turned and strode from the hall of Hades, and the flocks of following ghosts made way for him to pass. In vain he searched their ranks for a sight of his lost Eurydice. In vain he listened for the faintest sound behind. The barge of Chiron sank to the very gunwales beneath his weight, but no following passenger pressed it lower down. The way from the land of Hades to the upper world is long and hard, far easier to descend than climb. It was dark and misty, full of strange shapes and noises, yet in many places merely black and silent as the tomb. Here Orpheus would stop and listen, but nothing moved behind him. For all he could hear, he was utterly alone. Then he would wonder if the pitiless Hades were deceiving him. Suppose he came up to the light again and Eurydice was not there. Once he had charmed the ferryman and the dreadful monsters, but now they had heard his song. The second time his spell would be less powerful. He could never go again. Perhaps he had lost Eurydice by his readiness to believe. Every step he took, some instinct told him that he was going farther from his bride. He toiled up the path in reluctance and despair, stopping, listening, sighing, taking a few slow steps until the dark thinned out into grayness. Up ahead, a speck of light showed clearly the entrance to the cavern. At the final moment, Orpheus could bear no more. To go out into the light of day without his love seemed to him impossible. Before he had quite ascended, there was still a moment in which he could go back. Quick in the grayness he turned and saw a dim shade at his heels, as indistinct as the gray mist behind her. But still he could see the look of sadness on her face as he sprung forward saying, Eurydice, and he threw his arms about her. The shade dissolved in the circle of his arms like smoke. A little whisper seemed to say farewell as she scattered into mist and was gone. The unfortunate lover hastened back again down the steep, dark path, but all was in vain. This time the ghostly ferryman was deaf to his prayers. The very wildness of his mood made it impossible for him to attain the beauty of his former music. At last, his despair was so great that he could not even sing at all. For seven days he sat huddled together on the gray mud banks, listening to the wailing of the terrible river. 
The flitting ghost shrank back in a wide circle from the living man, but he paid them no attention. Only he sat with his eyes on Chiron, his ears ringing with the dreadful noise of sticks. Orpheus arose at last and stumbled back along the steep road he knew so well by now. When he came up to earth again, his song was pitiful but more beautiful than ever. Even the nightingale who mourned all night long would hush her voice to listen as Orpheus sat in some hidden place singing of his lost Eurydice. Men and women he could bear no longer, and when they came to hear him he drove them away. At last the women of Thrace, maddened by Dionysus and infuriated by Orpheus' contempt, fell upon him and killed him. It is said that as the body was swept down the river Hebrus, the dead lips still moved faintly and the rocks echoed for the last time, Eurydice. But the poet's eager spirit was already far down the familiar path. In the daffodil meadows he met the shade of Eurydice, and there they walk together, or where the path is narrow, the shade of Orpheus goes ahead and looks back at his love. So that was the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. I know that I usually talk about the character Orpheus or the hero Orpheus in this case or any other god or something from myths just to tell you the information but this time I chose to tell you the story in a more dramatic way let's say because it is a beautiful story I know it's sad but it is a beautiful story but now let's get back to Orpheus and talk about Orpheus in context Orpheus was much more than a mythological musician to many ancient Greeks. In fact, he was often viewed as a real person who had brought significant religious teachings to his followers. He was said to be the creator of the Orphic hymns, a body of myth that is similar to more traditional Greek beliefs, but emphasizes the importance of certain figures such as Dionysus and Persephone. Although very little is known about the details of the Orphic religion, its followers appear to have believed in the eternal nature of the human soul and an afterlife that was designed to reward the deserving and punish the undeserving. This was different from traditional Greek views of the underworld as a rather dismal place where nearly all dead people went regardless of their virtue. And now let's talk about some key themes and symbols we can take from the story of Orpheus. One of the main themes of the myth of Orpheus is the power of true love. After Eurydice dies and passes on to the underworld, Orpheus pursues her out of love. The power of music is also a recurring theme in the stories of Orpheus. The lyre of Orpheus symbolizes this power. Orpheus uses it to drown out the sirens so the Argonauts do not fall victim to them and later diffuses an argument between the sailors with one of his songs. While pursuing Eurydice, Orpheus uses his lyre to gain entrance to the underworld and his skill at playing music convinces Hades to let him take Eurydice back to the land of the living. Another important theme in this myth is obedience to the gods. When Orpheus disobeys Hades by looking back at Eurydice before they reach the surface, he breaks his agreement with Hades and Eurydice must return to the underworld. And now let's look how Orpheus is portrayed in art, literature, and everyday life. Over the centuries, the myth of Orpheus has endured as a tragic tale of love lost. Renaissance painters such as Rubens and Titian created depictions of Eurydice and Orpheus and several operas were written about the pair during the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. The most famous of these is Jack Offenbach's 1858 burlesque operetta Orpheus in the Underworld, which includes one piece known popularly as the music played during the French dance called the Cancan. -Can. More recently, the story of Eurydice and Orpheus was adapted for the 1959 film Black Orpheus by Marcel Camus, from which the music you heard in the story came. The 1995 Disney animated film Hercules used the plot from the myth of Eurydice and Orpheus, but instead had Hercules travel to the underworld in an attempt to save his love Megara. Eurydice and Orpheus also appear in The Sandman, a comic series written by Neil Gaiman. 
And now to the final part where there is a question I would like you to participate in and write your own opinion because based on the story of Orpheus, that brings us to a very important question regarding today's education. In modern times, many schools are cutting back on music and other arts-based programs in order to focus available funds on core classes such as science and math. Do you think music programs should be considered necessary for schools? Why or why not? Do you think music is more or less important now than it was in past cultures and why? If you would like to participate in this discussion, you can find the question embedded inside the post that I created specifically for this episode on our website, EnglishPlusPodcast.com. You can find the link in the description. Go to our website. You can get more information for our other episodes. You will find interactive activities, PDF downloadable worksheets, and more. But for this episode, you will find information, of course, about our story, Orpheus and Eurydice, and you will find a place where we can discuss this question. If you would like to join in the discussion, please join me, and I will answer your questions and discuss with you. Let's start the discussion about this very important question, in my opinion. And don't forget to support English Plus Podcast on Patreon. You will also find the link in the description. Support us so we can continue creating our daily episodes. Now, that being said, this is your host, Danny. I would like to thank you very much for listening to another episode from English Plus Podcast. I will see you next time.